I wanted my marriage to work. To be married for years and years and bring our children up in a loving way. Police recovered part of a fuse, angelic night residue from the... He'd grab my hair, hit into my arms, my legs, drag me up the hallway. More than 40 specially selected detectives have joined the time. Everyone was scared of him. I've got to run or is he's going to kill me. The bomb exploded. Mrs Watson took the full force of the blast, dying instantly. The blast was so strong that people had their clothes shredded off their bodies and shards of glass impacted into the body of a 12-year-old girl. There will be no limits uh, on their briefs to track down the perpetrators of these crimes. My name is Debbie Marshall. I'm an investigative crime journalist and author. For the past 10 years, I've been researching and writing about the family court murders. There are still really crucial pieces missing and we do need the public's help. And decades on, this story isn't over. I think of him every day. I talk to his photos every day. Previously, one man's lucky escape. At first, I thought, this is a practical joke. You know, this doesn't usually happen. This doesn't, you know, doesn't happen to me anyway from a bomb meant for Andrea's solicitor. Interior is destroyed. A series of menacing phone calls. And I said, listen, mate, we don't know where she's gone. Do not call here again. Before all hell breaks loose. He whispered to me, I love you. And that's when the bomb went off. The bomb exploded under the dais and flung the congregation around the hall. And the mysterious disappearance of Leonard Warwick's own sister. Look at her with the pigtails. Yes. Jenny, look. Never told me a thing about her. Didn't even know he had a sister. One of Australia's longest trials has finally come to an end with a judge finding Leonard John Warwick guilty of Sydney's family court bombings in the 1980s. Today, Leonard Warwick is serving three life sentences for the audaciously violent series of crimes he committed known as the family court murders. Sarah Doyle, do you remember when I told you that I'm not on Lenny Warwick's Christmas card list? Sure. And I wrote him a letter. I've got a response from him. You don't. I have. Take a look at that. Oh, it's handwritten. I, Leonard John Warwick, do not wish to have anything to do with Debbie Marshall. And it's signed L. Warwick. I mean, have a look at his handwriting. Big, angry, capital letters. And he knew this was coming through to me. Mm. That the prison would send it to me. I'm genuinely surprised you got a response. But long before Leonard Warwick is convicted of his crimes, he plays a dangerous game of cat and mouse with New South Wales police, where his behaviour becomes increasingly bizarre. What did he do under surveillance? He had some really odd behaviours, didn't he? Yes, he did. We found that he was travelling down to the National Park at Helensburg and in darkness he would then go up into the bushland. On the third occasion he did that, I was waiting for him down there with a night scope and a sniffer dog. Leonard Warwick came past me very close. I could hear him mumbling to himself as he sort of half jogged down the, uh, the side of the mountain. He was uh, quite at home. He had a torch, but he didn't have it on all the time. Not on this occasion, but on other occasions, the surveillance officers reported that when a helicopter went over at 3,000 feet, if he had the torch on, he would turn it off. On one occasion, Warwick is seen scurrying back and forth to his car, clutching a plastic bag. But the police night scope is unable to determine its contents. He kept going back to the National Park on a, a total of 11 occasions. He, and you never found out what he was doing no, in there? No, we didn't know whether he was 
uh, going into the bushland where he had something secreted. We uh, went in with the police dogs after he left when he was way out of the area. It was never really um, ironed out as to what he was doing there. I put it down to the fact that he was playing games with the surveillance officers. More disturbingly, police believe Warwick may be mentally unravelling. They're now also aware he's retaliating with his own counter-surveillance. Was there a thought that pushing this guy too far would absolutely push him over the edge? Yes. One of the surveillance officers said, look, I think we've got a, a worry um, because Warwick's sitting in, in the park watching police headquarters. And then I was aware from interviewing witnesses that he had been looking for my address and it did cause me uh, a great deal of concern. What about your wife? What did she think? Yes, well, the, the wife and the kids, I had his photo, his police photo on the fridge uh, all around the house here that if he was ever sighted in the neighbourhood, they were to uh, notify us immediately. He is frightening. He is a frightening person. Are you a violent man? No, Terry, I'm not. In 1986, television journalist Terry Willisey scores the hottest ticket in town an exclusive sit-down interview with an off-duty fireman, the prime suspect for the family court murders. The serious allegations against you are about serious and violent crimes, including uh, bombings. Do you have any knowledge of explosives? No, no, Terry, uh, I don't. Dr Leon Turnbull has spent years working with some of Australia's most violent and dangerous criminals. You're a forensic psychiatrist. What do they do? I principally deal with uh, people in the criminal system, Debbie. I've done over a decade of working with criminals in prisons and uh, in community settings. What sort of criminals? Are they killers or...? Very broad range, but certainly including the higher end of crimes. What brought you to that work? Just a fascination with the criminal mind. Although Dr Turnbull hasn't formally assessed Warwick, I'm interested to see what he makes of his television appearance. What's the most violent thing you've done? Well, I used to shoot rabbits. I suppose that's pretty violent. Knowing what we know now about Leonard, it's evident that he was seething, lacked absolute contrition, and was self-sabotaging in these interviews. You've been around killers a fair bit, I'd say, too. Very apparent with him. How did you feel when you heard about the death of Judge Opus? It didn't affect me emotionally, but I, I was quite surprised to hear it. But, uh, but, I mean, one hears about people being killed all the time on the roads and things like that. I attend uh, accidents where people are killed and... I, I try not to be uh, personally affected by the death of people. It's fascinating, a man whose professional career is dedicated to helping others mm. in life-threatening situations, and as we know now, was at the same time killing, and his ability to separate his emotions, it's just a cruel, cold nonchalance. Mm, didn't affect me emotionally. It's frightening the way he's conducting himself. How do you live, Mr Warwick, with the knowledge that you're suspected of some of the most violent crimes in this country's history? How do I live with that? Well, I have to put up with that, I suppose. Uh, it really doesn't make much difference to my uh, normal, everyday life. He presents as a mentally rigid man but in terms of his killings, they're incredibly flexible. And he goes from the diversity of guns to bombings. Well, there seems to be a campaign uh, by police to uh, set me up We're in relation to a number of uh, incidents. 
I've been uh, framed by them, I've been verbal by them, and uh, I have uh, no respect at all for these officers. Yet he sees himself as a victim, and there's this quasi sort of paranoia that he has about the people around him, organisations, institutions and society. But Leonard repeatedly displayed his own ability to create that dysfunction for himself. Mm. If you'd been assessing him, would you have kept out of his way? Absolutely. He's stunningly dangerous. He's dedicated his life to fairly uh, barbarous murders, not motivated by money or love, but something in the realm of hate. He's a very unique individual. Now retired, Terry Willisey has put public life behind him and declined to appear on camera. But he did record this for us to broadcast. One, two, three, four, five. To me, he had calculated exactly how he would handle this. Perhaps he'd even rehearsed it. And of course, in this interview, he had the advantage. He knew the whole story from start to finish. It was a bizarre and chilling performance. He really believed he was smart enough to get away with murder. As a crime journalist, I'm often drawn to the question of what turns a person into a serial killer, nature or nurture? Was Leonard Warwick born this way? Or did events from his childhood shape his warped psyche? These are questions I've yet to answer and why I've been searching for his sister Eileen to perhaps shed some light on their childhood. The problem is, Eileen's been missing for decades. Not just a mystery girl, she's a nowhere girl. Over the past few months, Serador and I have chased down every credible lead and small town rumour we hear. We've hit roadblock after roadblock. But now we have a lead that connects Eileen to this imposing building, the former Parramatta Girls' Home. Opened in the late 19th century, this notorious institution reformed wayward girls. Young women who were considered unruly, neglected, in trouble, or who were pregnant. In other words, a place to put girls that a conservative society just didn't know what to do with. Hello. Oh, hi, Kevin, Deb. I'm in the car with Serador. And we're actually outside the Parramatta Girls' Home. Yes, OK. So we're trying to track down Eileen's movements. Eileen was caught in a stolen car with a youth uh, in 1963. Uh, they were en route to Queensland. Queensland? Uh, yes. How old was she, please, in 1963? Uh, she was 15 years and seven months old when she was picked up. God, she's so young. Yes, yes. Far too young to be in a stolen car. They made it as far as Mullumbimby. And the youth that uh, was with her uh, did say that she told him she was running away from home because things were not good at home. So just, just to clarify, Kevin, you're saying that Eileen was sent into the care of child welfare after yes. she was caught in a stolen vehicle. Yes, that's correct. Kevin, why wouldn't she have been sent back into the care of her father? Well, that's a burning question that I don't know the answer to. I do know that Lily, her aunt, uh, did tell the police in 2015 she expressed the view that it was inappropriate for a young girl to be living with two men, a la her father and her brother Leonard John Warwick. Now, that does raise uh, the question of what the inappropriateness was, 
and and why was it so serious that this girl ran away from home oh heavens it's just getting sadder and sadder this story That a young woman could disappear so easily speaks to an era where women's value in society was yet to be recognised. A time when a woman's trajectory rarely extended beyond marriage, children and maintaining a well-run home. My last hope in finding any answers is with someone I've been searching for over a year, Eileen's cousin, Grant Marks. He's the son of Aunt Lily, with whom Eileen briefly lived in Western Sydney. We know that Eileen was released into the care of your mum uh, yeah. when she was 16. Yes. Something was wrong at her home life where she wasn't happy, so there was an option of her going into the welfare system or coming to live with mum and dad. So your mum, Lily, put her hand up, did she, to, yes. to yeah. take her in? Yes. How long did she live with you? It may have been three to six months, maybe a bit longer. It was like having a big sister. And she draw us beautiful pictures and buy us little toy cars. After Christmas 1964, she turned up again in 1965 with a present for your mum. Mm. Do you remember that? I remember her and mum made arrangements that they would meet again to the same date a year later and Mum was disappointed because that never happened. Did your Mum wait for her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It must have been, I'm sensing a great heartache. Uh, I remember Mum crying about it a lot and uh, going around the local shops looking for her. Do you realise that neither her brother nor her father uh, reported her missing? No. I don't know why Uncle Len wouldn't have reported his own daughter missing. What's your gut feeling, Greg? I have a sort of a sense that something bad has happened to her, but I'd really hope not. And I think Mum always thought that, but just hoped that one day she'd turn up or we'd get the truth or something like that, you know? It sounds like you really love her. Yeah, I did, yeah. It, it sounds like fond, you still do. Yeah, it's very fond memories of her. And uh, I'd like to say to Eileen, if you're still alive, to please contact any of the family that, that are living. Doesn't matter what's happened in the past, we'd all be happy to see you and catch up with you. A parting gift from Grant are poignant letters that the then 17-year-old Eileen penned when she was living inside these foreboding sandstone walls. In them, she writes a series of intriguing apologies. Dear Aunt Lily, I received your letter Friday night and I was happy to receive it as I didn't expect to hear from you after what I did to you. Dad always said I would land up in Parramatta. I finally did. Aunt Lily, do you think you could write to me while I'm here, please? You get very lonely up here. I have decided to wake up to myself before it's too late and to make a success of my life as my mother would want me to. I have written to Dad, but I've not heard from him yet. Sorry for all the trouble I caused you. These letters speak of a sad, lonely young woman reaching out for forgiveness. We could find no record of her father replying to her. After you uncovered that photograph of Eileen as a young girl, mm -hmm. Helensburg, mm -hmm. We sent the photo to a group of people to send us an age progression of what mm -hmm. she might look like today. Mm -hmm. Would you like to see it? Love to. We sent them photos of Lenny, as well as family members mm -hmm. that we could find. Mm -hmm. And wow. using that information and the photo of Eileen as a girl, they... This is a photo of what she'd look like today age 73. She just could be anybody living next door to you. Where is she, Cyrodiil? Whether Leonard Warwick knew anything about his sister's disappearance is anyone's guess. 
What is clear, though, is they shared a childhood without a loving maternal figure and a home life which shaped their destinies. A childhood that ended with one in jail for life and the other missing. Abuse, violence, stalking, bombings, murders. A relentless campaign of terror in order to gain custody of a child. At its centre, a mother who fears not only for her own life, but that of her daughter and anyone else close to her. Everyone was scared of him. Everyone who confronted him, their lives were in danger. Did you ever think that you're next? Yes. The police told me, you're next on his hit list. After fleeing Sydney to escape Warwick's threats and violence, Andrea and her sister Judy want to believe the worst is over. It isn't. No one has yet claimed responsibility for a bomb blast which ripped through a crowded Jehovah's Witness Church Hall in Sydney's Outer West this morning. I was shocked. I could not speak for a long time. I just burst out crying. 29 of the injured were taken to Liverpool Hospital, some with severe head and chest injuries. There were babies in there. There were newborn babies. There was a lot of babies. I know one baby stroller was blown from one end of the hall right up to the back of the hall. I had to do something to stop all these killings. Terrified there would be further murders and desperate to stop the mayhem, Andrea makes the ultimate heartbreaking sacrifice. She surrenders custody of their only daughter, Trudy, to Leonard. Once I did that, the killings and bombing stopped. So I was right all along. It was him. I'm a mother, Andrea. I can't imagine. It was heartbreaking saying goodbye to her, but I had to. What choice did I have? How do you live without your daughter? <sighs> You think about it all the time. As she going to school, as she get along with her father. And you just do. Warwick may have been a monster to Andrea, but Trudy loved her father and wanted to live with him. So was this about Trudy wanting to live with her father, or was this about you wanting to stop the murders, or was it both? Both. Because... I was at wit's end, my nerves weren't good and I thought to give her a bit of peace too, let her have time with her father and I said this will probably stop these killings and these bombings if he had her. After Andrea relinquishes custody of Trudy, the family court killer's reign of terror finally ends. In the years that follow, Trudy lives contentedly with her father. But when Warwick remarries and starts a family, the mood at home shifts. Unhappy, Trudy leaves home at 16. No one stops her. He chose the wife over his yep. daughter. Yep. This is the daughter he fought so hard for. Yes. I don't get that. His daughter was just a possession. Trudy's decided not to talk to us. Why is that? She wants to forget everything. She's had enough. She still loves her father, but she can't get over what he did to all those people. It hurts her. Deeply hurts her. You seem close to tears. I am, because I, I think it's, it's just so much wrong. Oh, Andrea. How could he do this to his own child? The emotional strain and the stress that she's been through. I, I, don't, I can't understand you. I never did anything to aggravate you. I did, I did everything he asked me to do. Justice Opas was a man who loved life. He was a man who loved his family. 
and who sought to do his duty as a judge in the court. And as a result of that, he's been killed. Six years after the first family court murder is committed, Leonard Warwick goes to ground, living a quiet life in outer Sydney. And police are left sifting through a mountain of evidence. Kevin, take us through the original police investigation. Which scene of those shootings and bombings provided the most physical evidence? The most physical evidence came from the Jehovah's Witness bombing, the murder of Graham Wikes. Firstly, there was a break-in there on the 13th and the 14th of July, 1985. The person who broke into the church on that occasion broke a pane of glass in a window and left copious amounts of blood inside the church. This spot here was the window which police believed the church was entered on both occasions. As you can see, a large section of the carpet, which was covered with human blood, has been taken away for analysis. We did know that the offender was Warwick. But it wasn't enough, Kevin, was it? It wasn't enough from the point of view that we couldn't gather enough evidence to charge him then. And what people today have to take into account is back in that, that era, we did not have DNA evidence. As the months roll into years, the family court murders fade from centre stage on the police radar. While the victims and their families, still haunted by the shootings and bombings, fear the family court killer will never face justice. It's not until 2013 when public interest is renewed in the case following the broadcast of the Channel 7 investigation and the publication of my book the following year. By now, the family court murders are the coldest of cold cases, subject to only sporadic review, until a cold case unit starts a dedicated investigation. You were the person, weren't you, who tipped off someone in the police force to check the blood found at the Jehovah's Witness Hall for DNA. Well, Debbie, go back nine years, I told you. Because you asked me the question, how can we get this fellow? And I said to you that there was blood left at the church on the 13th of July. But Kevin, why did they test the blood from the Jehovah's Witness Hall? Where did that idea come from? Me. Thank you. I went and I assisted the, the cold case unit as much as I could and gave evidence for a lengthy period of time. Kevin, bricks were found under Leonard Warwick's house at Casula. What are the significance of those bricks? The house bricks that were found under his premises were located by the cold case unit. They executed a search warrant in 2016. Uh, they took with them a brick doctor, a Professor Charles Sorrell. Professor Sorrell examined the bricks scientifically and he compared them with the bricks found on Stephen Blanchard's body in Cowan Creek. He formed the opinion that there was a possibility that those bricks came from the same production run. Each production run produces enough bricks to build around 80 houses. But the claim the bricks were from the same production batch was never definitively concluded in court. Detectives delve back into the archives and resurrect the blood-stained carpet found in the Jehovah's Witness Hall. Despite the fact it had been in storage for almost three decades, detectives were really hopeful that one small trace of DNA may just reveal the identity of the offender who broke into the hall. And extraordinarily, it does. DNA testing has matched the blood as consistent with the accused's DNA. Testing proves a paternal link between the bloodstains and Warwick's daughter, Trudy, with the staggering odds of one in 310 million that it was not Warwick's DNA found in the hall. Those faded smears of blood on the carpet and cardboard will become Exhibit A in the police case against Leonard Warwick. Tonight, an arrest over one of Sydney's biggest unsolved crimes, a man in custody over the family court bombings and murders in the 1980s. 
Police swoop on Warwick while he's at the gym. He's charged with 24 offences, including the murders of Stephen Blanchard, Justice David Opaz, Pearl Watson and Graham Wikes. As Warwick picks up his gym bag, he tells the arresting officer there are no bombs in it. Retired detective Kevin Woods worked on the family law court bombings in the early 80s. He must have thought this day would never eventuate. The belief was always that, uh, that he would eventually be brought to justice. But the wheels of justice did turn very, very slowly. Finally, after nearly four decades since the murders began, Leonard Warwick is brought to trial. But he isn't going down without a fight and pleads his innocence on every charge. The accused, Leonard John Warwick, pleaded not guilty to each of the 24 counts on the indictment. Lasting almost two years, it will be one of the longest continual murder trials in Australia's legal history. This was a distinct period of violent offending against judicial officers in a way not seen before in any court in Australia. Justice Garling is meticulous in his findings and leaves no stone unturned. One by one, he reads the verdicts. That the accused did murder David Opas, I find and return a verdict of guilty. The attempted murder of Justice Richard G. I find and return a verdict of guilty. The Parramatta court bombing, the murder of Pearl Watson, and the Jehovah's Witness Hall bombing resulting in the death of Graham Wikes. I find and return a verdict of guilty. His judgment takes more than two hours to deliver. One of Australia's longest trials has finally come to an end with a judge finding Leonard John Warwick guilty of Sydney's family court bombings in the 1980s. Many of the victims' families, including Joy Wikes, finally see justice served. Positive. <laughs> it's guilty. It was a long time coming, but we got it. Oh. But for Andrea and Judy, it's bittersweet. Today, the former fireman was convicted on all but one count. Warwick was found not guilty of shooting dead his former brother-in-law, Stephen Blanchard. No one saw him do it. There was no DNA or other trace evidence which connects the accused to the murder. The Crown case is that Mr Blanchard was shot in his bedroom. It would have been, in my assessment, extraordinarily difficult for one person to remove Mr Blanchard's body from the house without waking the other inhabitants of the house. It is more likely that at least two people were involved in this murder. The existence of a motive is not a necessary element for the finding of guilt of an offence. However, the fact that there is no established motive and no specific ill will between Mr Blanchard and the accused makes it far less likely that the accused would have committed the offence. I find the accused and return a verdict of not guilty. The judge's reasoning? The Crown had failed to prove his guilt beyond reasonable doubt. A guilty verdict in a murder trial demands the highest burden of proof. There simply wasn't enough evidence to deliver a verdict other than not guilty. I think Andrew and Judy and I have something in common, and that is we've both had people close to us murdered and their bodies have been found. Where we differ is that I've had justice and they have not. When my partner Ron was murdered, it set me on an unwavering path to find answers and a relentless pursuit of his killer. I wanted justice. I doubt that he will see the sky as a free man and I think we should all breathe um, a sigh of relief for that. I want it now too for Andrea and Judy. Justice Garling found that it was more likely two people were involved with Stephen's murder. I'm hoping to show otherwise. By recreating what we know about both Leonard Warwick and the Blanchard crime scene, with behavioural insights from Chris Illingsworth, our criminal profiler. 
We've got a floor plan here to scale. Let's take a look, go inside, see where Stephen's bedroom is. Okay. All right, yep. after you, Chris. We've got the front steps and in through the lounge room door. The Blanchard house no longer exists, but we've been able to draw on Andrea and Judy's memories to recreate the layout and scale, combined with evidence from court transcripts. We'll continue around into this hallway that runs from the bedroom at the front of the house where Andrea was sleeping with the baby, Trudy. Mm -hmm. This is another bedroom where their father slept, but he wasn't there, so this is actually an empty bedroom. And this is Stephen's bedroom. Around the time of his murder, Stephen was working on his station wagon and kept two car seats behind his bedroom door. Sarah Doll, you're the same height and build as Blanchard. Let's run through some scenarios, see if you got him out the door or out the window. Yeah, I mean, let's do it. So, Dad, let's take a look at how the offender gained entry. Wouldn't have been through the front door because that's where the bedroom is. Would have been through this back door here. Now, we know Stephen came home at midnight, so it's sometime during the hours of darkness that this happens. Now, I'm going to use this timber dowel to replicate the firearm. So the offender would have walked in quietly, stealthily, opened the back door, then made his way through the house. In the darkness, silently, he knows the people sleeping down there. That's Andrea and Trudy. Now, at this point, he would have looked in, seen Stephen there asleep, and decided to keep going. He enters through silently, carefully, and approaches Stephen, who's got no idea what's about to happen. Walks up, places the firearm above his head, and he shoots. Although not tendered as evidence in court, Police believe the killer used a silencer to muffle the noise of the rifle's discharge. And Stephen's now deceased or dying. Now, at this point, the offender has to put down the firearm and he takes out a plastic bag that he's brought with him. He places the plastic bag over Stephen's head and that's to contain the blood because he doesn't want the blood on his vehicle or on himself. And he then has to deal with getting the body out of the room. For the purposes of this exercise, I need to assume Leonard Warwick is the killer. To assist us with that, I've asked Chris Yorgart to join us. He was Warwick's boss at Liverpool Fire Station and they're roughly the same height and build. You've had years of experience as a fiery. Yeah. How did the offender get a body out of this small space? Uh, Len was a very big, powerful, well-built person. He would struggle to get through that door. I quickly realised the obvious way to create more space is to move one of the chairs. OK, yep. And then, uh, with the door fully open, do a, uh, a lift from behind the shoulders and grab him around the chest and drag him out with his heels dragged onto the ground. Yep. Rescuing unconscious victims from a burning building is all part of a fireman's job. So now the offender's dragging Stephen through the kitchen area and he has to come through this kitchen door area and around this corner. And now you're in the back door, going down the steps and out of the house. Well, wow. that worked well. And that's taken hardly any time at all. Yeah, that's, that's probably not even a minute. Mm -hmm. The easiest way to dispose of the murder weapon is to wrap it in the bed sheets, which are likely to be bloodstained, and then toss it out the window. And the windows, what's the drop? About a metre, a metre and a half? About a metre and a half. The next job for the offender to do is to reset the room. It's got to be back how it was. Restaging the crime scene to make it appear that Stephen has disappeared isn't necessary. But creating a missing person is calculated to cause his family maximum heartache. Now he has to get the body yep. and take it away from the scene. A standard fireman's lift takes care of removing the body from the property. And off. Right, and then down the side of the house. The court found that at least two offenders were likely to be required to remove Blanchard's body from the house to avoid making noise to wake the other inhabitants. Our recreation has clearly shown it could have been done by one covert intruder who could work quickly and silently. Now we want to test if the offender could make the 100 kilometre round trip to dispose of the body in Cowan Creek. 
We believe the easiest way it could be done is with a boat and trailer. So most likely the offender arrived here with the trailer already attached to the boat. He doesn't have much time. He wants to get all of this done, dispose of Stephen's body and get back to where he's got to be under the cover of darkness. So there is a time constraint for this offender. When you look at it, Debbie, really the murder of Stephen Blanchard, it was a logistical nightmare. The offender had until six o'clock, a five hour window, to get the body out of the house number one, into a boat, travel 60 kilometres up to Cowan Creek and then launch the boat and dispose of the body. The deadline is critical, as Chris's profiling has revealed Blanchard's killer only worked under the cover of darkness. So we want to look at the timing, leaving the Reesby house, getting up to the boat launch area, allowing enough time to launch the boat, dispose of the body, and complete this whole operation before dawn. She also travels on roads that only existed in 1980. We're not going to use any tolls or motorways. We're using the old road system. A missing piece of the puzzle has always been the offender's access to a boat. Police found no evidence that Warwick either owned a boat, stole a boat, or hired one near Cowan Creek. The offender could have got the boat in a number of ways. He could have hired the boat, probably under a false name, paid cash. Uh, back in those days, there was no photograph identification for a driver's license. It was just a little small piece of paper that you just had to sign. And another way would be uh, to steal it, but I, I doubt he would do that because he wouldn't want to be driving through the streets of Sydney with a stolen boat uh, in case the owner had reported it and the police were looking for it. So I don't think he'd do that. With little traffic on the road, it takes just 75 minutes to reach the boat ramp. Only a few minutes to launch. And travelling at a speed of less than 10 knots, for which you don't need a licence, it's another 30 minutes to arrive at the point where the body was found. Stephen weighed around 65 kilos. The house bricks added another 42 kilos. Not the easiest of lifts, unless you're a firefighter trained to lift dead weights. Then, allowing extra time for the southerly blowing that night, it's 35 minutes back to the marina. Again, just minutes to winch the boat onto the trailer and 90 minutes back to Warwick's home in Casula. All before the first glow of nautical twilight at 5.39 a.m. A round trip of four and a quarter hours, all done under the cover of complete darkness. So is the boat the smoking gun we're looking for? It would be. It would, it would be compelling evidence to be able to prove that he did have access to a boat. It's one thing to have a theory, but it's another to produce the evidence. And really what's needed is somebody to come forward. Having examined each crime scene in minute detail, Chris has created an impressive analysis of criminal behaviours for both the Blanchard murder and all the family court crimes. Chris, you've put together an incredible profile on the Blanchard murder. Already I can see similarities across these other crimes. So there's some major points that come out of the profile for me. All of these have, have been targeted victims. Uh, for example, here's one. Opus. Opus, and up here we've got the another two, Watson and G. They were all targeted in the family home or in a place that was sacrosanct to them. Their victimology is similar. And over here, the Kingdom Hall and the car bomb also. Uh, surveillance? Yeah, they've all got surveillance components. Surveillance was used on every occasion. He is watching and waiting to strike. There's meticulous planning and it's been very well executed. It's been well prepared for, well organised. Uh, this is a thinking offender. The killer operated in darkness all the time. Sneaks about. Well, he's definitely prowling around. He, he was not accountable to anyone at night. 
he doesn't have to be anywhere. So that suggests that he may not be married at the time, so he can be out and about without being scrutinised or questioned. So what does all this tell you, Chris? For me, I'd be saying there are consistencies between the two offenders. If these were all unsolved crimes, I would be advising the investigators that there are strong similarities here. In all likelihood, this would be the same offender. Debbie, how are you? Good, how are you? Long time no see. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Andrea, do you remember I made some promises to you? I've got a couple of updates for you. So we've done a lot of work looking uh, to see what happened to Stephen and we found that his body absolutely could have been disposed of by one person alone. Right, OK particularly a person as young and fit as Lenny Warwick was at that time. We've also found, Andrea, he could have been driven all the way to Cowan Creek and back again under the cover of darkness. And also, do you remember that we had a criminal profiler on board, Chris Ellingsworth? Yeah. She said that if she were advising New South Wales police, she would tell them to look for just one offender so, Andrea, I don't know if it's enough for New South Wales Police to reopen the case, but it's compelling, isn't it? Yeah, that's good news. Maybe Cold Case will take another look at it with fresh eyes. You know, we need to hope now that that something comes of it. That's, that's the best we can do now. Oh, well, that's, that's something anyway. It's just wait and see. Yeah, exactly. What happens, you know, that's all we can do. And thank you, Andrea. Thanks for your patience with us. It's been a long, long ride, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Yeah. Too long, really. All right, then. Okay, okay, okay Andrea. Thanks for everything. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Andrew. Bye-bye. Is what we've done really enough to satisfy police and reopen the case? I've put the results of our efforts to well-respected QC, David Galbally. One of the main reasons forwarded for the not guilty verdict was that it would have been extraordinarily difficult, quote, for a single person to remove Stephen Blanchard from the house without waking the other inhabitants, and then to transport it to the dump site at Cowan Creek. So the judge noted, if Blanchard was killed in the house, it is more likely that two people were involved. David, we recreated the crime scene to show that one individual could single-handedly remove that body from the house. For a retrial to take place, uh, one would need to have a new piece of evidence, what the law calls fresh evidence, that was not available at the time of the original trial. And I don't think that that would form uh, fresh evidence. Justice Garling found that Warwick did not own or have ready access to a boat at the time of the murder. I found that an extraordinary fact because I don't think it matters, does it, whether he owned a boat or whether he had ready access in the sense of a boat being at his doorstep to use. Um, it's not hard to go and get a boat if you want to get a boat. There were many factors, as you know, David, that the judge acknowledged could suggest Warwick's involvement in the murder. They included a proficiency with firearms, knowledge of the Blanchard's home, opportunity, he wasn't rusted on at work, his resistance to any attempts by the family court to reduce access to his daughter. So that's, you know, a fairly long list. Perhaps most telling, though, the analysis of the bricks from underneath his former matrimonial home were found to be very similar to the bricks used to weigh down Stephen's body. This, I think, was probably the closest physical evidence that was presented. Why was that not enough? When I went through all those pieces of evidence, all put together, they're rather compelling to point towards his guilt. 
Uh, the judge concluded that the Crown has failed to persuade me beyond reasonable doubt that the accused is guilty of the murder of Stephen Blanchard. So what do you say to this verdict, David? Well, I can... It's... It's... It's, it's a verdict that's very subjective in the sense that he... The judge forms a view on all of the facts and he's both judge and jury in this matter. Um, I've found the found his conclusion to be not in accordance with the conclusion I would have come to uh, in relation to that, but then I'm looking at it from a different perspective and at a different time. What conclusion would you have come to? I, I think that, it, that he committed the, the crimes. That's the view that I've, that I came to. You think he's, he murdered Stephen Blanchard? I do, yeah. I think the facts point, in my mind, the facts point to that. What can we do, David, to get this back over the line? The only way to get this up and running, as it were, is to find that fresh evidence. That is evidence that was not available at the time that these matters were first heard. So at this point, in your opinion, we don't have enough? There, there's no fresh evidence. What would be the smoking gun for a case like this? Just a small piece of evidence that could link him to it. Um, when you look at all of the evidence and his behaviour and whatnot, it's very easy to come to the conclusion he must have done it. Now, must have done it is not the legal test. That is not beyond reasonable it's doubt. It's not beyond reasonable doubt. There needs to be another piece of evidence, a scintilla piece of evidence that can just link him to it. In the beginning, all Andrea ever wanted was a loving husband and family. In its place, she suffered verbal and emotional abuse, coercive control and violence. She dared to walk away, seeking out what at the time should have been a no-frills divorce, hoping for an amicable custody arrangement for her daughter. What sort of person is Andrea? Like all of us, we just wanted someone to care about us, someone to love us. And I think that's why she she went on that blind date and met Len. And she told me that she, she did love him. Yeah, she's told me the same. I don't think the love lasted very long, though, did it? No. It didn't last through the violence? No. So your advice to women who are watching this, or, or men, is if you are in a violent relationship, get out. Yes, absolutely. Run, run absolutely. You've got to recognise the danger signals, and Debbie, the stats don't lie. There's one woman a week is murdered by her partner or former partner, ten women a day are hospitalised after being assaulted as the result of domestic violence. Now, those figures are staggering. It's a national disgrace. Family violence happens to anyone, no matter how nice your house is, how intelligent you are. It can happen to everybody. This is still an enormous problem in our society, a problem that we all share. What gives me hope Hearing somebody speaking out, people who have experienced horrific problems, situations, violence, it takes bravery and courage to get up and stand up for something that's right, to improve humanity as best we can. Finally, the conversation around domestic violence in Australia is gaining momentum. I think. Family violence has always been there, and what we are seeing now, thankfully, is that people are more um, free to tell their stories of what's happened to them. 
Uh, we've seen women come forward with their stories who previously just put up with things that occurred to them because that was just par for the course. What we're seeing is that the unacceptable nature of that behaviour is finally being recognised by society and the courts are very, very much better attuned now, I think, to, to dealing with it. Now there's a court framework which aims to support the most vulnerable who are seeking a way out. Chief Justice, the recent merger of the Federal Circuit Court with the Family Court is the most revolutionary change since the introduction of the Family Court in 1976. How are you building on its legacy? We've got a fantastic opportunity now to finally provide Australian families with the kind of family law system they deserve. That includes making sure we are as efficient as possible so that we can reduce delays, reduce costs and get litigants through the system as quickly as we possibly can. And most importantly, identify risk at the earliest stages in family law litigation. Positive changes include more resources to help couples mediate and greater awareness of the risks surrounding family violence. But it's still early days for this new merged court and it will take time to know if these measures are working. And in the end, can any court fix the pain of divorce and the prevalence of domestic violence? What's your advice to people, Andrea, who may find themselves in a similar situation? Don't stay in that relationship. Get help. You've got to think of yourself, and if there's children involved, you've got to think of the children's lives. What about women like yourself? who are locked in the house, who are financially cut off, who are emotionally destroyed. It's a hard battle to get back on your feet, but there's so much help out there today. Get help if you can, get help as much as you can. I say to any woman, you don't have to stand for that. There is no need to stand for that violence against you. If you or someone you know is affected by any of the issues raised in this program, please contact the following services. Lifeline 13 11 14 1800 RESPECT 1800 737 732